The following program is made possible in part by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Welcome visitors and church family. It is always special to be with you. You know, I think it's so important for us to know that God is not just able to heal. He is also more than willing to heal all. That includes you who believe on him. You are so loved. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Thank you for being with us. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for everything you've done for us and everything you've given us. And we come with just gratitude in our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name that you can continue to form us into the likeness of your son. We're grateful for you, Lord, and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I.
Preparation for the message, 2 Samuel 6.18. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Mishal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Mishal, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he had appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls she spoke of, I will be held in honor. Church, may our hearts always esteem God's opinion over the world's opinion. Amen.
you so much for joining us on Hour of Power today. We hope you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Spring is a time of abundance, a time when we can savor the colors and the sights and sounds of God's creation. In fact, everywhere we look, we can taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 36, seven and eight says, how priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. Our Savior welcomes each of us to taste his blessings and to drink of his delights. And this is what our power is all about. By helping us take the gospel message around the globe, you enable millions to feast on the wonders of the Lord's goodness from the comfort of their own homes. For 51 years, we've proclaimed the hope of Christ's love and extended his heart of hospitality to countless lost and hurting souls. As you've joined us in this mission, we've seen many, many people transformed by the nourishment of divine truth and blessed by the gift of gathering in the family of God. In fact, this legacy is at the heart of our special May offer. For your one-time gift of $150 or five monthly gifts of $30, we'll send you the Taste and See book and kitchen set. Perfect for spring and summer, this colorful culinary inspired collection is enhanced by a vibrant floral motif and includes our brand new Taste and See Gathering the Lord's Goodness book. Featuring beautiful photographs, memories and recipes shared by members of our Hour of Power and Shepherd's Grove staff, this collection was compiled to inspire you to welcome people to your heart and your home. We've also included a glass cutting board inscribed with the phrase, be grateful, and a reference to Hebrews 12, 28, a matching ceramic trivet with the words, be faithful, and a reference to Luke 16, 10, a coordinating ceramic spoon rest with the words, be grateful, and a reference to Hebrews 12, 28, and a colorful embroidered cotton tea towel with the words, be thankful, and a reference to Colossians 3:15. Call, write, or go online and request the Taste and See book and kitchen set for your one-time gift of $150 or five monthly gifts of $30. Hannah and I are praying that the many flavors of God's goodness will overwhelm your senses in the midst of the spring season. May He flood your heart with joy and fill your hands with heavenly gifts that can be tasted, seen, and shared with others. Thank you so much, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we. Terika Joy Smith is a writer who boldly stepped out in 2019 to create the faith-based magazine Eden and Vine, wanting a space to combine her love of gardening, photography, and her deep desire to help women grow in their relationship with God. This groundbreaking publication was born. By cultivating beauty and truth for everyday life, Eden and Vine not only gives home inspiration, but offers practical guidance on how to embrace abundant blessings in every season. Please welcome Terika Joy Smith. Terika, hi. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. I'm looking at your magazine. So it's, you. it's beautiful. This is a wonderful thing that you're doing. But for those who don't know much about your work, uh, tell us a little bit about your story. Well, I'm a mom and a wife. I homeschool my kids. I live in the hills in Tennessee. Um, and a few years ago, God called us to this truly life-giving and beautiful work. Um, and it's just our greatest joy. We do it right here from the hills. Um, not a lot of pomp and circumstance goes into it. We have a very small team and it is truly just an act of worship and obedience, really and truly. That's awesome. So tell me, you, you have like, I'm trying to understand, you have like a farm at your house? I mean, I, <laughs> we I, do. I, it used to be like 90% of Americans, like my grandparents would be mortified by that statement, you know, but, but you have a farm at your house? <laughs> well, we have a hobby farm and so we have chickens and peacocks and we've had goats and horses and so it goes right along with our homeschool vibe the kids love it they do chores and we count that as part of what they learn week to week so it is a hobby farm we don't have like large crops or anything of that nature but we have a lot of fun for sure yeah so how does that work into sort of your magazine and being a mom and all of that sort of go together 
you know, it's, it works hand in hand, believe it or not, because um, it's our backdrop for everything that we do. And in growing gardens and tending animals and all of those types of things, that's where we pull a lot of our photography from. Um, and it's also what we use a lot of our content for because we are a faith-based but garden-themed publication. And so, so many lessons we learn are right from the garden. And there's no better way to teach those lessons than to learn them as you have your hands in the soil. So um, it works together beautifully. It's a beautiful partnership. How, how does um, like farming, or not even farming, I guess you say gardening and faith-based, like how do those two intersect? You know, it's one of the things that over the past few years, God has really opened my eyes to understand that um, if we pay attention, the garden or the Bible rather from start to finish is full of botanical language and garden language. Life itself began in a garden. And then we also see throughout scripture, Jesus was laid to rest in a garden in the garden tomb. Of course, we hear about the garden in paradise and the garden in Gethsemane where he often prayed. So I always kind of reason, joke with people. I'm like, I think gardens are pretty spectacularly important to God because he used them as some of the most beautiful and important backdrops from Genesis to Revelation. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, when you think about how many of Jesus' metaphors and parables, you know, in those days, everybody sort of had a farm, you know? You could have a little mm -hmm. garden in your backyard where you're growing vegetables or spices or things like that for cooking. A lot of countries still do that. And so Jesus really was speaking the language of, of everyday people. It feels like so many people link a sense of spiritual loss. Like living, if you've lived in a city or you live in a densely populated area, like we're in Orange County, 3.6 million people here, just outside of Los Angeles, millions of people all crammed into one area. There's more people in the greater Los Angeles area than there are in Sweden. So it's like interesting to think about how, and, and real estate becomes an issue. Do you have a lot of, so like you talk about gardening and stuff, do you have a lot of people in places like New York and LA that like your magazine, that are like trying to figure out, how can I with my, you know, six by three brick backyard, you know, have a garden? Yes, we do. That's actually one of the things we focus a fair amount of attention on is how to help everyone, no matter where they're at, cultivate their own Eden, as we call it, hand in hand with the one true vine. Um, and so we do, we'll talk about things as simple as um, creating what we call indoor gardens, just with home decor. Or is, could it be just a, a little herb garden on, um, you know, a bright windowsill? So there's lots of ways to do that. And uh, we just get really creative and kind of equipping women, especially for how they can do that themselves. But you can do it on any scale. You certainly do not have to have acres and acres of land. Um, you can do it with a windowsill. You can do it with no light at all, like the, you know, like I mentioned. But there's a lot of ways to do it. It's just a matter of getting creative. Yeah, awesome. Um one thing I love that you talk about is intentionally cultivating your faith. Tell us a little bit about, about that as well. And how can you encourage people today who kind of feel like they're not cultivating their faith well? Well, cultivating our faith is no different than cultivating a garden. It requires sowing. It requires tending. It requires harvesting. It requires periods of rest. And so, again, we see throughout Scripture how Jesus used that um, very terminology to encourage us. What does it look like to sow, you know, in terms of faith? What does it look like to sow love to our neighbors? What does it look like to sow time and intention into our families? Um, and so throughout, like we see that uh, our faith is no different. It's no different than growing a garden. I think that's what's so amazing about gardening and why we have a um, garden themed publication. It's because there's so many similar similarities and parallels between the two. They both require lots of work but there's so much beauty to be found when we do it. Yeah, a lot of people don't think of their faith as work, the way you would for training for a sport or tending a garden, but these are the types of analogies we see in the Bible. It's real work and it takes effort and consistency. You forget to water your plants, they're gonna die. You forget to tend your spiritual life, you can die spiritually. That's exactly right. It is a lot of work, but the best things in life are the things that we put our hands to that we really invested in. That's when we really appreciate them. And so with our faith, you know, I grow roses a lot and I kind of joke with people. I have them all around my porch and I'm like, they're the most time consuming, all the deadheading, all the pruning, all the feeding, all the fighting disease, but they're the most beautiful, most beautiful thing that I grow. So the things that we put the most work in are probably always going to be the things that are most beautiful at the end of the day. Well, speaking of beautiful, Eden and Vine is a beautiful magazine and I'm so grateful that I get my own copy here today. 
Terika Joy Smith, thank you so much. Check out this new magazine, Eden and Vine. I know you'll love it. And uh, we appreciate all the things that you're helping us do in learning to tend our gardens and tend our faith. Thank you. you stand with us? We're going to say this creed together as we do every week. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, popularity was an important thing. I think it's been that way for a while. I'd be interested to talk to my grandparents and see if there was the popularity complex as well in their day. But I remember as a kid in the 80s and 90s, popularity, I mean, was like an important thing. And so much of my life and so many kids' lives revolved around, you know, not being at the very bottom and hoping someday you can be at the very top. You know, this idea that, the, that you'd be this, you know, popular kid. I went to a small school in L.A. called Village, and I had a mixed experience, and I think part of that was because it was such a small school, you knew everyone's name, and because of that, you knew everyone's status in the school. And I was grateful that in my 11th grade year, we moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I went to a school that had 2,000 kids, and that was just juniors and seniors. 
And I think because of the size of the school, the popularity thing seemed to evaporate. And I recognized how much of an unconscious burden it was for me as an insecure kid you know, going into high school. And it was interesting because, you know, Haven and I, we get breakfast every Wednesday and we talk about things. And one thing I started to warn her about as she's going to be in middle school next year is I was warning her about this window that I think for most kids is around between 8th grade and 10th grade where you're transitioning really from being a kid to being kind of a grown-up. You're going from you know, playing, you know, a lot of games and toys and things into things like having to wor worry about, you know, fashion and worry about boys or girls and, and all these different things. And so just kind of warning her that that can be a tough time emotionally because, well, everybody goes crazy when they're a teenager, aren't, don't they? I remember I had a guy and he said, you know what happens when your child reaches about ninth grade, aliens come and they take their brain and they abduct it and then right around 18 they come back and they put the brain back in your kid's head and you get your kid back. I said, okay, I'll just... I've never had teenagers, but for those of you who have teenagers, you can affirm to me later on whether or not that's true. But I, this begged the question about popularity and I wondered, do I want my kids to be popular when they get to high school? There's lots of reasons why you wouldn't want your kids to be popular in high school. Probably the number one reason is that they end up working later in life for the nerdiest kids in high school. <laughs> Bill Gates, Elon Musk. But for me, I don't know about you, the answer is no. I don't want Haven to be popular, actually. You kind of, it's not that I would be upset if she were, but that's not like a goal. You know what I mean? Like, Haven, if you're popular, that's great. No problem. But at no point would I want what I wanted for her, what I actually wanted when I was there. Does that make sense? If you asked a 10th grade Bobby Schuler, do you want to be popular? He'd be like, yes, please. God, I'd do anything. <laughs> what I really want for my kids is for them to have a positive experience. And I, I began to beg the question, and this is a question I've asked a lot. Why is it that we don't want for ourselves what we want for our kids. And maybe you don't have kids and so you don't, you, you probably get the question, but you might say, you could even say, why don't I want for myself what I want for my pets? There have been studies that show that when people have a sick pet, they'll do everything to take care of their pet. They'll give them their medicine at the right time. They'll give them healthy food. But when they're sick and the doctor gives them medicine, they themselves don't take the medicine or they don't feed themselves well, they don't take care of themselves. Some people have thought that maybe there's this worthiness thing, that you value your pet, you love your pet, so you want your pet to be healthy and happy. But maybe there's something about yourself that you don't think maybe I'm worth taking care of. It's not worth bothering at least. I just wanna say that you, you are worth taking care of, you know? You, you are precious in God's sight and that Maybe it would be a good exercise to think what I would want for my children or maybe my nieces and nephews or my pet or someone that I love or care for. Well, maybe I should want those things for me. And yet I find that even though high school is over, the popularity contest is still kind of around, even in churches, believe it or not, even in ministries. That although it's more subtle and sophisticated, it's not any less obvious who's popular and unpopular, who's cool and uncool, where the cliques are, how you belong, how you're in, and how you're out. Our world is full of all manners of status symbols, cars and the way you dress, the friends you have. Semi-famous people love to name drop super famous people. Maybe you have a friend in your life and they always talk about how they're friends with Val Kilmer. I did that once, but it was a lie. I just met him once. <laughs> he, signed a, he signed a DVD for me, and I started saying he was my friend. And there's different classes, too. This happens in academia. We talk about the papers you publish. You put the diplomas on your wall. And this happens with blue check marks and the amount of followers that you have on your social media, things like this. I remember when I was in college, you know, I had no money. I was in business school. And I was in business school because I had no money. I had to figure out how to make some money. But one thing I could do was play piano. 
And so I used that to sort of barter. So what I would do is if I needed something, I would barter with other students and I would teach them piano. So for example, one girl would cut my hair every other week and I would give her a piano lesson. I had another friend, Heidi, who taught me how to play golf and I'd give her a piano lesson. I had a guy who taught me how to play drums and I never got good at it, but you know, I was doing piano lessons and I had an accounting tutor and piano lessons. And so I was giving piano lessons constantly to all sorts of people and one thing that's began to trouble me after doing that for years is I started to realize I'm pretty sure the vast majority of my piano students didn't really like piano or they didn't like me. You know, Mr. Miyagi said there's no such thing as a bad student, only a bad teacher. So it's probably my fault. But I came to this conclusion. It seemed like a lot of, if not most of my students didn't want to play piano because they liked piano or they liked music. Rather, they wanted to be a guy who played piano. Does that make sense? It's not that I really want to play piano. I want to be a guy who can play piano. So for example, I overheard one of my students saying that he's classically trained in piano. I was just behind him. He was in the cafeteria. He was with a group of friends. He was a friend of mine, too. And of course, being a wingman, I said, yeah, he's getting really good. But in my head, I was thinking, you still haven't learned hot cross buns. <laughs> And here you are telling everybody you're classically trained in piano. <laughs> it's interesting because with social media, this has all gotten, you know, you always hear about it, right? I mean, it's gotten even heightened. People only show the best things about their life. And it's, there's nothing wrong with that. Except that there's a heart behind some of it, you know, like... Definitely with signaling, you know, you get on Twitter and Facebook and someone will talk about the most recent one that I've seen that's totally stupid is the... Snow White, people are criticizing the Snow White ride because it's an unconsented kiss. I guess she's just supposed to stay dead. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, people talking about something about a Starbucks cup and how it doesn't say the right thing or how. And what I think people are doing in most cases, they're trying to project an image. I'm a leader. I'm a moral person. I'm a thinker. I'm educated. I'm not ignorant like you. When you get onto Instagram, you also see the same thing, you know, people always wearing the finest, nicest clothes. See, the problem with this is there's nothing wrong with any of this. That's why it works. There's a lot of people who are just like fashion. And then there's other people who are fashionable because they want you to think they're fashionable. Just like there's some people who want to play piano and learn it. And then there's other people who just want to be a guy who plays piano. To which I always said, if you wanted to impress people, why didn't you learn guitar? Girls like guitar players way more than piano players. I'm speaking from experience. <laughs> I remember once I asked Robert, our executive producer, I found this guy who was a pastor also, you know, and he had like a million followers on, on Instagram, and, but he would have like 18 comments on his pictures or videos. And I asked Robert, I was like, this is so weird. This is like three years ago. I didn't understand yet. Like, this is so weird. This guy has like millions of followers but almost no engagement, you know, comparatively. I mean, you look at Joel Osteen, he's got like thousands of comments and the same amount of followers, and this guy's got like eight. And I was like, what is that? And he goes, oh, he's just buying followers. I said, I'm sorry, what? He's like, he's, he's buying followers. They have like fake accounts. There's like thousands of fake accounts and they're limitless and they all have pictures and profiles and everything. And then they follow you and it's all fake. I said, what are you talking about? I said, why are we paying Darshan? You can do that? How much is it? Get me on board. Just kidding, I didn't do it. Because the same thing, you're like, what, Bobby does that? No. In fact, I remember Rashawn, the guy that I worked for, when he was giving me a report for our social media followers, he says, these are all, and the word he used was hilarious. All of these followers are organic. I was like, like milk? Organic? <laughs> what does organic mean? It means they're real. I said, well, I should hope so. No, uh, no Instagram steroids for hour of power. Well, anyway, all of these things, you see that in life, all of us, we do this, don't we? We, we find ways, whether it's well, you know, what we dress or wear, we find subtle ways that we can hope that our life at least looks like it's making an impact. Or we can at least 
feel like our life has value or, or, or feel like in, in a way we're popular. And I guess what I'm really saying is the older I get, the more I realize how sad people are. I mean that literally. That many people who have a smile on their face. I, I think of like when Robin Williams committed suicide, you know, just a hilarious comedian at everything in the world just seemed like would be the happiest person in the world, but deep down inside was very sad. I think a lot of this posturing and a lot of this projecting of, of ego and images, and a lot of this fragility is coming from a place where people, they just want to belong, you know? They want to have friends. They want to have a family that loves them just as they are. They want to, they want to have people who are there for them. They want to be missed when they're gone. They want people to be waiting for them when they get home in the airport or they want people to invite them over for dinner and, and want to feel like when they're there they don't have to pretend to be somebody else. And the more transient our world gets and the more people move across the country and fly everywhere and live every, you know, all over the place and they connect digitally, there's this missing bit under the surface where there's this just kind of you know, you, you want your life to, to have more meaning. It just seems like it's losing meaning. And so that, all of that to simply say, well, two things. One, that the church needs to be the answer to this. It always has been for 2,000 years, the answer to this question. And that's why I grow troubled. And I even feel sometimes, honestly, like very hesitant about things like social media or fashion or professionalism, the word professionalism in church. There's something like if you go to a church and everybody is really fashionable and really good looking, there's nothing wrong with that, but there's like, at least for someone like me, it feels like I don't know if I really would fit in here. It's one reason I wear a suit, as weird as it sounds, like our age has changed to where, you know, I just refuse to wear Yeezys and a leather jacket when I preach, you know? <laughs> I don't know if that's funny to anybody else, but it's hilarious to me. <laughs> because that's what I, I kind of, I kind of get that feeling of like, popularity contest where, where, where you really, and I, I'm not here to judge anyone, I'm just here more to say that as churches, as ministry people, we have to be careful that, that we just love everybody and that, and that we even project that in, in what we do and, and who's in front of everybody and, and you know, that, we, that when you come to a place like Shepherd's Grove, that you really do feel like you belong and I, I hope you do feel that way because you do and we, we just really love you. And so, but really the church has to be on guard against things like vanity and vainglory. Vanity meaning it's all about what's on the outside and vainglory being like, look at the impact we're having, look at all the great things we're doing. This, I'm talking to Bobby Shuler, you know, this is something I have to be careful of, of, of as a leader because as believers, whether it's in the church or just when you go back to your job this week or whatever it is you're doing, that we're supposed to provide an alternative to what the world offers. The world offers vanity and and be popular and, and be perfect and do everything right, but the, the church is supposed to offer the inverse of that. Even when you're broken and you're hurting and you're, you're messing up, God loves you so much and God is rooting for you and your best days are ahead of you. See, those are two different, two different voices. Okay, so all of this to simply say, let's live not for man's approval or for our neighbor's approval, but for God's approval. When we are in deep communion with God and we know him and we're living for him, then even when we're completely alone, we're not alone. When, when you go into a place where you feel completely bored and nobody's around and nobody's calling you and you're reaching out for God in that time, there is a, a, a deeper loneliness that doesn't completely go away, but it's, it's in a way satiated and cared for and it gets you through. And this is why... That personal life with God, the prayer life, the seeking him, the digging into his word is so key to surviving in a modern world. To, to not being deceived by Satan or by the world. But that true life comes from the spirit of God living within me. And I couldn't do anything without it. I couldn't survive without it. I couldn't breathe without it. Without the Lord inside of me. And when you have that, all, everything else just seems so stupid and s like such a waste of time and so sad. Because it's a dim reflection of what's really available in God's life and love for you. Okay. So I, when I think about someone 
who just doesn't seem to care about what other people think most of the time, someone I want to be more like, it's King David. It's interesting, one question I ask a lot is, why did God favor King David so much? He wasn't that great of a guy, to be honest with you. There's a lot of things, like if you're making a report card, there's a lot of things that, that David would be on the sort of poop list, the black list, you know, like this guy. And yet, God loves David. And people love David. Like what? He's one of the most famous characters in the Bible and people just really like his personality. And I'm like, what is it about David that makes him so favorable in the eyes of the Lord? And I think it's that he's all heart. And that at the end of the day, when he makes a mistake, he's not prideful and arrogant, but he's in sackcloth and ashes. And that most of the time, all he seems to care about is that the Lord knows that he loves them, that, he, that David loves the Lord. And he does anything he can to show God how much his love is for the Lord. Second Samuel begins with David's meteoric rise as a king. King Saul has died, and David is just completely brokenhearted about it, which seems so silly. I mean, this guy Saul was demon-possessed and constantly trying to trap David and kill him. And yet when he dies, David is brokenhearted about it. Because he, like, there's this loyalty. And David, who before Saul died, was already a great general, very keen leader. People seem to love him. And right when Saul dies, all of the tribes of Israel come before David and they rally because they are thrilled that David will be their king now. They're, they want to follow him. This doesn't typically happen in the ancient world. Usually there's a lot of fighting and arguing and diplomatic ploys and bribes. But at least in this case, they all come to David and they want to follow him and serve him. And so he has a number of victories, the most notable of which is that he takes the city of Jerusalem, which at that point has been occupied by the Jebusites forever. The Jebusites, when they see David coming, they're mocking him and they're saying, like, anybody can man these walls, there's no way you can get it. And David, being a great general in the middle of the night, finds a waterway, which being an experienced general, he would have known that many cities, in order to get through sieges, would have these waterways. And so he just probably found one. He'd probably exploited it in lots of other cities before, and they took the city no problem. And now that Jerusalem had become the capital of Judah and is really well placed between Israel and Judah, he decides this thing, the throne of God, the Ark of the Covenant, which has been mobile now for a long time in a tabernacle, going to different places like Shiloh, and it'd be in a certain place for this period, and then move here and there. At one point, the Philistines take it. It's just constantly going. He decides we're going to make a house for God and we're going to have God's throne in Jerusalem and Jerusalem is going to be the city of God and the city of David. So he goes and he gets the Ark of the Covenant. You know what that is, right? I always make this joke. Raiders of the Lost Ark, big golden killing box. The, the truth is the, the Ark of the Covenant held the original Ten Commandments that God wrote with his finger. I mean, it's like this amazing thing and it's the throne of God. And there's a way you're supposed to move this box. But as I read the story, I think that David has a celebration going on. Everybody's excited. Jerusalem's been taken. There's a party going on. He just wants to get the ark to Jerusalem. And so instead of carrying it the way that the law says on poles with some ceremony and, you know, he just throw, like basically just puts it on a cart with an ox and just starts carting it to Jerusalem as quick as it can. And it, something happens and it hits a snag. And now a lot of people, there's two ways to interpret this text. Most people think that the text says the ox stumbled and Uzzah, to keep the ark from falling, you know, put his hand against the ark and then, and then died, which might be true. But there's another way to read the text, and that is that the cart got stuck. So it was already bad because it would be like, imagine the Queen of England, you know, is coming to to the White House, and you're in North Carolina, and so you're like, throw her in the back of a pickup. Let's go. This is how, the, this is how it is. You know, they're like, you're supposed to carry it on poles with priests and stuff. They just threw it in a cart. And so the last straw is when, I think it's, it's better to read it as the ox stumbles, meaning it got stuck. And so Uzzah, who's leading the thing, you know, puts a shoulder into it. And he's like, let's get this thing out of here. And so 
He like kind of like tries to like, like you would if you're pushing a pickup truck. And that was like the last straw. Uzzah dies. David gets super angry with God, which again is why I think God loves David. It's just like completely honest. Just like really angry with God. Like we're just trying to get the ark to Jerusalem. And so they kind of leave it there at a guy's house named Odom Edom. And he's kind of like their guinea pig. Because they're like, well, let's just leave it here for a while and see what happens. And because he's not a Nazi, he, not only doesn't he, he doesn't die, but there's just this outpouring of blessing on his house. And this causes David to think about everything. And he goes, you know what? I, this is my interpretation. I think the spirit at, at the beginning was just, you know, being, it was just expedience. It was like, let's hurry up. Let's hurry up and get this done. And, it, and instead of that, he was like, let's take our time. And so they take the ark and they carry it on poles. And, and every, and David, by the way, David never, ever dances naked before the Lord. Write that down in your Bible. He doesn't dance naked. He doesn't dance half naked. David dresses in an ephod and linen, so he would have dressed like that. That doesn't look naked to me. He's dressing like a priest or a high priest to show God, so he gets out of his royal robes, which would have been the finest, you know, jewelry and maybe silks or, or special stuff, you know, it would have been like his Armani special design suit, you know, and he puts on this thing, this burlap deal to show God, I am, before I am a king, I'm a priest. I'm here to serve you. This is your kingdom, God. And before the Ark of the Covenant, he dances like crazy everywhere he goes. And every six feet, they make a sacrifice to God. So they go from super fast to like, let's carry it on our shoulders. Let's make a sacrifice to God. And it's like a snail's pace. And then when they get to Jerusalem... This huge celebration breaks out. And David's just like, I don't know how David danced. But just is jumping up and down. And there's trumpets and there's drums. And, he, and to show his lowliness, he goes to all of the servants and all of the lowborn, the lowest people. And he just begins to give out cake. Isn't that great? You take a cake and you get a cake and you get some bread. And he just begins to bless everyone. And this huge eruption of praise you know, envelops the city of Jerusalem and the ark arrives at Jerusalem. And while this is happening, David's wife, Michal, is watching from a window and she wants to throw up. Michal was Saul's daughter. She was a princess her whole life. And she was all about not associating with the lowborn, of always having a level of decorum and propriety, especially for the king. This would have been how Saul would have tried to act and how he would have taught McCall to live as a princess and now a queen. You carry yourself the way a king would. You carry yourself the way a queen would. And when he comes up to the rim, you can tell that there's already some seething resentment in the marriage. And she looks at him and she goes, how my husband, the king of Israel, dignifies himself Dancing naked in front of the servant girls. This is where we get the idea that he was dancing naked. In her mind, dressing as a priest instead of as a king, you might as well be naked. And David's response is, I, if it's for the Lord, I will be even more undignified than this. There is no limit to how much I will show the Lord with all my heart that I love him. David effectively saying, I do not care what people think. I do not need to be popular. I do not need to be rich. I do not need to be king. I need to be the Lord's child and that alone. All he wants is for God to see that he loves him and that he's grateful. David says, I will become even more undignified than this if that's what the Lord needs to see that I bleed for him that I long for him, that I want him. And this is, there's so much wisdom in this, you know? 
That's why I think David in general was probably a happy person. Ironically, people that tend to care the least about popularity tend to be the most popular. And I think that's why David's so popular to us thousands of years later. He just didn't care. I'll finish with this idea. Jesus says in Luke, Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. My grandpa Scott, before he passed away, he was a Baptist minister. And when he would drive too fast in his car and you could tell, he'd go, whoa, Nelly. Whoa, Nelly. That's a good way to read this passage. When you see whoa, don't hear cursed. Hear careful. Whoa. Be careful. When everybody is talking good about you, when everybody thinks you're, when, you, when you're the most popular, when you're the most rich, when everything's going your way, everything's perfect, and the world thinks everything is great for you, be careful. That's how they treated the false prophets. That's how they treated people who caused the most harm in the kingdom of God. In the inverse is, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Great is your reward in the heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, the true prophets. So in life, when everybody loves us, there is probably a part of our life that is deeply veiled, or you might say fake. And that causes us to have an, um, like an inner uh, emptiness that only goes away when we're honestly ourselves and we have people in our lives that love us, especially the Lord, in that way. Does that make sense? So seek after God. Seek after his approval. And the more you do that, a lot of these, a lot of the noise that's made in life and in social circles or in your job or in your church or whatever it is you're doing, it'll just kind of, it never goes away completely, but it'll, it'll lose its sting. And you'll be given an incredible strength when you care so much more about what God thinks than what people think. Hey, we're rooting for you, and we love you. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you'd help us to understand how much you love us. And help us, Lord, to live our lives in honor of you first. We can never get let go of the things we have to do in society, in life, and in our jobs. We have things we have to do, but we pray, God, that in our heart, we would live for you. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us? coming to church today and for being the church this week and I pray that this is a wonderful week for you make sure you come back next week 
And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. to our channel yet? If not, then I hope you will. Our power is filled with uplifting content to nourish your spirit and help you grow closer to Jesus. We've created this channel to remind you that no matter who you are or what you've done, God loves you and so do we.